the rest of your time is just going to be on the basis of how good the guy fixing it was, and if he's no good, it's, it's hell. Good day, and welcome to uh, <laughs> the uh, church, and we we're talking about fixing the camera whose lens you're looking through right now and watching this thing because it's spritzing all over. The place. Little wires, you know what you do? We, when, we, when, we, when we fix up the stuff at the end of the day, we wrap the wires up around the thing, which you shouldn't do. Absolutely shouldn't do. So now the wire is telling us that you shouldn't have done that because it's, uh, you know, shorting out. What is the truth? This is an interesting thing. What is, does anybody know what the truth is? Have any idea or any concept of what the truth is? If I, tell, if I stand up here and tell you a lie and you believe it, it's the truth. Or if I step up here and tell you the truth and you don't believe it, it's a lie. And it depends on you. It's not so much what's being said to you, it's what you take into yourself. So how do we find the truth? You have now what you call the New Age movement. You've gone through the Old Age movement and all of these different types of movements. And you have people come on television and they're telling you it's this way. And you go to churches and they're telling you it's this way. And the government says it's this way. So you, you have to do something that people in religious circles have never been uh, used to doing. That is you have to use your mind. And that's off limits in religion. Don't do that, because once you start doing that, you're going to start bucking the establishment, and once you start bucking the establishment, you're either going to get kicked out, shot, or whatever. What they say, basically, you get, uh, what do they say, disintegrated, what do they do when they kick them out? Excommunicated. Ex you're going to get excommunicated, and that's the ultimate hell, you know, you're going to get kicked out of the church, which is, which is, in essence, the most wonderful thing that can happen to you, to get kicked out of the church. But there's no magic. No magic exists. There are no miracles. Because if you're going to imply some kind of a miracle, you can't. I mean, that's a terrible word, miracle. There is no such thing as a miracle. A miracle is just something that hasn't happened yet. As soon as it happens, it's, there's a lot. As soon as it happens, no matter what it is, you can explain it. Doesn't make any difference how, oh, that was a miracle. No, there was an explanation to it. It's a lot, there's a logical explanation to it. It's a scientific principle. I mean, things don't happen unless there is something inside. If somebody has a, a healing that's because there's something went kaboom with the, the internal structure of the human body, the electrons or whatever it was, and it responded in such a way that it can happen to anybody. There's no such thing as a miracle. A miracle is just something that hasn't happened yet. And there is, a, there is a thought here that what is our potential? There was a Jay Bailey who said, the human heart has not yet fully uttered itself, which is really good. I mean, right now, you are on the verge of seeing something cosmically, seeing something in the universe, seeing something in the atmosphere, seeing something in human minds that you never dreamed possible. And all of these things are starting to manifest themselves in your thought patterns and in the thought patterns of people all over the world, and not only in thought patterns, but in nature, in, 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 the, in the change that's happening on the earth, and in the cosmos. All of it is in, a, it is in a time of tremendous change, and of course that affects you. If something happens up here, it's going to affect you down here. It does. I mean, you know, uh, the sun emits all of this radiation, electromagnetic fields, and then it gets picked up down here and it transported to the earth, and here you're walking around with all of this electronics inside of your head, and you're going to be changed. You're going to be, you're, you're going to be a different person. You're going to think differently. And that's, that's of course, the function of the universe. In the Bible, in page 932, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, a statement that is starting to be fulfilled today, because I dare say if the people who wrote it understood, page 932, if the people who wrote what's about to be said here uh, could see the condition of the world 2,000 years after that was written, and it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Basically, you know, here we're looking at something that was written uh, on some kind of a tablet or some kind of a papyrus sheet or an old animal skin. And, you know, the guy that was writing this thing had never heard of computers or calculators or all of the amazing things that happen in the atomic age that we live in. But let's just think here. Let's just, let's, let's take it out of the realm of, of that. And let's put it into the realm that we can kind of understand. I mean, this is a fact. If you take you and me, okay, I'll draw the best I can. There we go. Let me even put a smile. 
All right, you and me, here we have over here the 10% of the brain that we use. 10%. 90% is off limits to us. Now just think for a minute, what are the possibilities in your life, the life of your children, what are the possibilities for the world, what are the possibilities for the earth, if we begin to stimulate the brain cells over here and start actually using them, because the best of us is 90% ignorant. What are the potential, what's the possibilities? You have school teachers who sit in school and are instructing people, they are instructing people out of 10% of the brain and they are instructing other people and entering into their 10%. The other 90% has nothing to do with it. See? Of course, you know, and I've, and I've said this before, and I've said it many times, and it's very important to understand that when the ancients talked about tithing or giving 10%, they were talking about that right there. They weren't talking about money. The churches kind of prostituted it and turned it around and says, give us 10% of your money. That's not what is intended. The intention is go into meditation, shut down this tenth, and when you shut down this tenth, you open up the 90%, which, which is, of course, what happened. You know, look at that, look at that simply in, in the ways of the sun. The sun does the same thing. The sun, through the trajectory of the earth, you know, moves around and it moves up to the point where it's at now with the spring equinox, the vernal equinox, Aries the ram, is, uh, is sacrificed, if you would, the sacrifice of the ram as the sun consumes it, then moves over to the right side, and then summer comes. Something happens on the earth. This is the earth, all right? You don't have to believe anything I say. You don't have to study this. You don't really have to go anywhere. You've just lived through, in the East Coast, one of the worst winters we've ever had. Something happens when the sun energizes itself and sits at the right side. In the Northern Hemisphere, when it sits at the right side or the East, something happens. And what that something is called is what's about to spring on you now, called spring. And then summer. But it can't happen until this energy goes to the right side. I mean, you know, you don't have to be a nuclear scientist to know this. That's a fact. And you're about ready to see it. Every year, the sun is born of a virgin, crucified, three days and three nights in the winter solstice, born on December the 25th, into the waterman Aquarius, into the Pisces, the fish, the Lamb of God that takes away the cold of the winter is Aries, and it's happening right now. Then the sun moves over to the right hemisphere, and summer comes. I mean, you, you know, so people say, well, I don't, you better not listen to that. How can you, how can you deny, you can't deny that. Because that's an astronomical fact. It's the way the thing works. And you are simply a duplicate of the, of, of, of the universe. And inside of you, the same thing must happen. The virgin birth through meditation, the crucifixion of the five senses through meditation, sitting in the darkness of the tomb of meditation, being reborn through the spirit, rising up through the water, which is the truth, then through the fish, which is, which is the wisdom and understanding of the spirit, and then hitting the pineal gland of the brain, and then you energize the right hemisphere of the brain, and summer comes to your life. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all for. So, I mean, you can, you can see the proof of it in, 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 in the seasons. You can see the proof of it on the earth. And, and so then what are the possibilities if you start to listen to the Buddhas and the Christ and the Krishnas and, 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 and the Plato's and these ancient people who try to tell you something will happen if you'll activate that right hemisphere of the brain. What is it that could happen? And what you're, the reason that you're sitting here and the reason that you're watching this on t television and the reason that you're turning television on and seeing Bill Moyers talking to Joseph Campbell or turning television on and seeing John Bradshaw or turning on and seeing all of these people who are talking is because you're becoming sensitive to your own divine potential. You have a potential. And the churches and the religions have always told you you were a scuzzball, you were a worthless sinner, you don't admit to anything or amount to anything, and the only thing you got to hope for is that you drop dead so you can go to heaven. That's all they've ever sold you, and they charged you for it, made you join the crowd, sign the card, and then when you die, you get your goodies, and that's the only thing they've ever said. But here you're suddenly finding out, no, there's something here inside of me that has a potential that I can activate while I'm alive. And it requires you to have a closer union with nature. Look at your life. Look at the life of your children. Look at the life of mankind and womankind. Look at the lives of the children on this planet and say, this is the result of your heritage. It stinks. It's not good. It's not healthy. It's not wholesome. It's violent. And so now you come to a point where you say, well, maybe I should begin to say, 
does my system work in the same way that nature works? And if so, how do I, pla how, how do I ta tack into it? How do I touch it? So, so you can read the Bible. You can read the ancient words. And when you do, you're going to say, well, these are, 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 are people in a different time. These are ancient people. These are old people. These are things that happened thousands of years ago. The truth is, and this is something that comes from a, a Hindu guru who says, the essential is forever the same. The essential is forever the same. Since the Big Bang, the sun has always been moving in this particular type of a trajectory, going through these constellations and winding up at the right side. Always since, it's always been that way. This is nothing new. There were people, and you've seen them on television, they would go and they would dig into the earth and they would dig into the ancient temples and the ruins of the old places. They traveled through the desert to the east and they uncovered rocks and they scraped off signs off of the, off of the walls of these temples at Karnak and all of these places. And what were they trying to find out? What, they said, what the heck is it? What is it that, that these people were, were saying to us? You know, it's just like you can go in, into Arizona and go into some of the, the cave dwellings or some of the cliff dwellings and see things etched on the walls and people don't know what the heck they mean, let alone what's meant hundreds or thousands, maybe millions of years ago. So the point is where and who and what is this thing we call God? You know something? You know we talk about the degrading of women? You know how we talk about, I'm going I'm to share something that has nothing to do with tonight, it just came into my mind, but I, I think it's interesting. Go to the first page of the Bible. And the first page of the Bible, you see where it says, in the beginning, God, very first page. Verse 2, God moved upon the waters. Verse 3, and God said. Verse 4, and God saw. Verse 5, and God called. Verse 6, and God said. Verse 7, and God made. Verse 8, God, 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 God. All the way through that thing. You see the word God? Do you know that that word was put in there by the church? Do you know that that word God was devised by the... Do you know what the word is in that first page of the Bible? This is the word. E-L-O-H-I-M. Do you know what that means? Male and female. Do you know what? That means male and female. The male and female principles of the universe. And they took it out and they changed it and put God. They made a sexless, masculine fakakta and put it on the first page and used it as a derivative of the word good. And they took an O out and there was God. And so then your other friend that they scared the hell out of you with, who was evil, they put a D on the front, made him the devil, and there you have the whole thing. But that is the word. And you can go into the original text, and you'll find the original text is Elohim, which means the male and female aspects of that which is nature and that which is... Couldn't deal with that, especially the female part. So once that female part was in there, we have to erase it. Don't let anybody know, and it becomes God. The Christian cult that you belong to, or the Christian cult that you have belonged to, is the only cult in the universe that doesn't have a name for it, so they call him God. Okay. But they had to get the sexist female part out of there, and that Elohim was no good. And so, see, Elohim is a plural. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a singular God. See, don't you see what has it? Let us make man in our image. Oh, Adam ate the apple. He has become as one of us. So we, we constructed it, told everybody there was a father God. He's a father. He's a man. He sits up there somewhere and, and, and just believe it. And, that's all. and you never questioned it. How dare you question it? You never even thought about it. You, never, you just came and you sat in these doggone chairs and you sang Amazing Grace, what a wretch you are. And you sang it and you gave money and you lit candles and you hid behind the stained glass with all of these people and nobody ever even dared question what they were telling us. How could this possibly, how could he possibly be done? Oh, thank you, Pastor. Oh, pray. And then you go in and in confession doing these things, or you get people putting your hands on your head and all of this kind of stuff, and you never even go, what the, who changed all of this? I told you, for the, all you got to do is open the Bible, Tommy, look in the fact that in Palestine there's a guy named Nathaniel and Beatrice and Philip and, and John and Peter, Paul and Mary and all these people. Who put their names in there like that? Yeah, who is Beatrice? I don't know where Beatrice is. <laughs> Philip, Nathaniel, Bartholomew, John, and all of these English people. But because people changed it. 
How could there be somebody? You can go all over Palestine. I will reward you with $1,000 if you find somebody who's a Jew born in Palestine by the name of Bartholomew or Philip. Well, who are the other ones? Elizabeth! Get the, and this is the best part. You got two English people in the Garden of Eden, the primordial place, Adam and Eve. Tip, tip, having a cup of tea, spot of tea. Hey, oh, oh, Eve. We got somebody who comes to church here named Eve. She's English. She's from London. Anybody named Eve is from London. <laughs> but you got him in the Garden of Eden. See? And so you got all of these, and they say, oh, don't change the Bible here. I got all these English people running around. It's a joke. Anyhow. So the truth is essential. But what happens that the, the, the people who are doing all the digging and all the searching and all of the, what do they call archaeology, discovered something that the people of the East were endowed with strange powers. And they found this. And what we began to learn from the sages of the East is that by combining science with religion, the existence of God may be demonstrated. It's exactly what is called in, in our vernacular in this day, the cosmic Christ. If there is such a thing as God, it has to be provable, or don't, don't bother with it. It's ridiculous to sit and, and, and to sit, come into these places in churches and have people tell you these stories about some God that's going to take care of you after you drop dead, or if you wait upon the Lord, they'll say, and for your answer to come. And how do you know? And if, it, and if you get something that you like, you'll say, God said it. If you, if you don't like it, then, you know, it's, uh, you, nobody knows. So there's no, there's no possible way for you as a, as a human being to come into a position of saying, I heard from God. Whoever did. Whoever could say, I heard from God. Because this is the, mere, this is the fact of the thing. And we've done this over and over. But that's you. Way down here on the earth, there's heaven up here. It's in your mind. And if there's, a, you're down. Here you are. You heard from the, what did you hear from? God saying, stop it or do it? Oh, until you make a connection between this and this, you can't hear from anything. It has to be a circuit. There's an electronic fact that this is the way it happens. But you have to do it according to the ways that Jesus and the Buddha taught. So, if there is such a thing as faith, then the faith has to be in yourself. Because no other person on the face of the earth will be able to tell you truth except yourself. No other person will be able to show you except yourself. So the only thing that you can possibly have faith in is yourself. Anything else on the, uh, anything else on the planet will disappoint you and can cause you much grief. And you can disappoint yourself, but that's all you can do is have faith in that immortal self. Contemporary religion cannot deal with the concentration on the self. They're scared of it. I, I, you know, I went through all of my life until, I guess I was 40, and never understood any of that. I never knew any of this stuff. I, nobody ever told me any of this stuff. I never knew you had a right hemisphere of the brain. I never knew you had a pineal gland of the brain. I never knew there was any scientific aspect of God. I never knew any of these things. Nobody ever told me. And then I began to find out something. When I began to study this stuff, and I looked at Jesus Christ because he, you know, the Western guru, I guess we would say. It was Jesus Christ who was the most vocal proponent of the knowledge of oneself and the possibilities. The possibilities that can happen if you start to understand this and start to trust it. And let's, let's look at what the possibilities are. Go to page 853. Page 853. Many of you have seen this thing over and over and over again, but in other, in other words, these are the possibilities. The first possibility that's echoed by Jesus Christ, not by me, but by Jesus Christ, is Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is within you. That's a possibility. What if this guy, you know, this is Jesus. Here, put him in a G-A-E-S-U-S. Jesus said it. Not me, not John Bradshaw, not Joseph Campbell. Jesus Christ, on your Christmas cards and your Easter cards, he's the guy that said this. The kingdom is within you. Now just think of the possibility. If, if, if it's possible to fulfill yourself, isn't that something that you would, 
See, he said it. If there was such a person as Jesus, he said that, according to this. But I don't have anything else to go by, any other kind of documents, and I don't know where else we can find any people from the ancient. This is the guy that said that. He didn't say it was in church. He didn't say it was religion. He didn't say it was in a Bible because there was no Bible. He said, it's in you. Okay. Watch. Page 780. Page 780. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus Christ says this. Two. You are the light of the world. He didn't say he was the light of the world. He said, you're the light of the world. How come he didn't say you were a rotten, snot, and sinner like the, the, the religious people say? How come he didn't say you're a lost? How come he didn't say you got to sign a card? How come he didn't say, you know, you're going to hell, you need to... He said, you're the light of the world. The kingdom is within you. Well, what I just told you is Jesus said it. You're the light of the world. The kingdom is within you. In other words, there is a potential. What a tremendous... But is this true or is he a liar? Is he a liar? If he's a liar, okay, then the whole thing is shot. But if there is some truth, in, then the reason that I feel that there's some truth here is because Krishna said the same thing, and Buddha said the same thing. You're the light of the world. The kingdom is within you. This should give you some encouragement. What is the potential? Now what is your potential? What is your potential? Okay, go to page 847. Page 847 and Luke chapter 11. Page 847, Luke chapter 11. He's talking to the Bible scholars of the day. They called them lawyers because those are the ones who made up the biblical law. Woe unto you, lawyers. You have taken away the key of knowledge. Now he's going to describe what is the key of knowledge. You have taken away the key of knowledge because you entered not in yourselves. The key of knowledge. Knowledge. Understanding. In you. You've got to enter inside of yourself in order to have the key of knowledge. Jesus said it. He said the kingdom is within you. He said you're the light of the world. And he says you take away the key of knowledge when you don't enter in yourself. He didn't say you had to enter into church. You don't have to come here. It is no big deal if you don't, if you don't come here, you don't come here. That's your business. You don't turn on the television, you don't turn on these tapes, that's your business. It's none of my business. I can't, I'm not here to force anybody, to make anybody, to tell anybody. I'm saying simply that this Jesus Christ that you got on your bumper stickers, you take a day off for of Christmas, he's the guy that said it, it's in you. Now, go to page 880. Because you've been raised on Jesus, you've been raised to understand Jesus, you've been raised to, 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 to find Jesus in your life and, and all of these things. Look what he says. John chapter 14, and look, look what he says. Now, I want, this, is, this is a good one. He that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do, and greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. In other words, Jesus Christ is saying you can do better than him. It, if he was alive today, he'd be hired by the biggest corporations in the country as a motivational speaker because that's what they do. They try to motivate you. And what, what Jesus was trying to do is motivate people away from religion. What I'm trying to do is motivate people away from religion, away from the government, away from the IRS, away from all the structures that try to say you're something wrong, there's something wrong with you, you're under suspicion and all of these things, away from religion that tries to say you're worthless, that you need a savior. Jesus Christ says the salvation that you need is inside of yourself. There is a special light inside of you that is the light of the world. The key of knowledge is inside of you and that if you listen to him and do what he says, you can do better than him. In spite of the fact he's in the Bible and you're not. He says you can do better than him. That's good. So how could you fulfill these statements if it wasn't true that the human self is the center of all miracle? It has to be the human self has to be the center of all life, or you couldn't fulfill these things. And the things that Jesus Christ said wouldn't be right, but they are right. They are true. And the reason that you've had trouble all of your lives is because the church and the system has put you down and said, no, there's something wrong with you. You need to come to our group. You don't need to come to their group. You don't need to be in any group. You shouldn't be in any group. You should be an individual, and you should strive to find that which is within you and lead other people to find that which is within them. Because only by everybody finding the light within inside themselves can order come out of the chaos that is in this world. And there's plenty of it. 
if you take one drop of water, Albert, you're the scientist, one drop of water proves the existence of great power of water someplace else. Where did it come from? Where did that one drop of water come from? It came from something beyond a larger source in the same way the sages of the East says that your spirit proves the existence of the God spirit. You are like a drop of water that came from the great waters. You are an individual group, an individual person who comes from that which is the great waters, which we call God, for, no, for lack of another word. So blind faith is not necessary. Blind faith is something you shouldn't have because faith is only something you need when you're not sure. When you're not sure, they say, have faith. You know what? When somebody tells you they have faith, you know what that means? They can't explain it. Why don't they just say, I don't know? I can't explain it. They will tell you that, especially somebody that's in a religion. I will tell you that I don't know or I don't understand. They'll say, have faith. That's a put down. It put, put you off. You know, oh, just go, go have faith and don't rock the boat and everything will come out okay after you're dead. You know, great. It's terrific. Something really to look forward to. You know, oh, I can't wait to that. You know, they stick you in a box, give you half a suit, shove some uh, toilet paper in your mouth, and this is it. This is the best you're going to get. Used to be newspaper. What do they put in their mouth? Newspaper? Stick, cotton? Ah, newspapers. Put newspapers, half a suit, put you in a box, and say, here, this is what you got for 40, 50, 60, 70 years of giving them 10% of your money and going in there and singing Amazing Grace for the rest. And you are a wretch. You're laying in this box. But you're gone. <coughs> so what does the Apostle Paul say about having faith? Page 979. We read it this morning, but it's worthwhile seeing. It's in Hebrews chapter 6. What does he say? He says in Hebrews chapter 6, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, go on to perfection, and do not lay again the foundation of repentance and of faith towards God. You should not have faith towards God because you should understand that you are one with the eternal, universal, natural energy that we call God. And you can, you can, you can, you can do this yourself or, or not. That's your business. It's none of my business. And as I said, and I've told people over and over again, I'm not here to make anybody believe anything, but I am here to do something that religion does not tolerate, and that's to get people to think. And once people start thinking, they break away from those people. And it's been 2,000 years since Jesus Christ. And just think, Albert, what would have been the condition of the human race today if science had not broken into the superstitions of religion? Where your religion comes from was a period of time that history has labeled the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages is one thing and one thing only. Christianity. That's the Dark Ages. That was the point where the church said you're not allowed to think. If you're a scientist, you must agree with the Bible. If you're an astronomer, you must agree with the Bible. And the astronomers and the scientists who didn't agree with the Bible had their throats slit or got burned at the stake. The Dark Ages. They had some beautiful things, processions. One of them was called the Inquisition. Terror. I mean, you talk about Yasser Arafat. And, 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 I, and, and you know, that raises an issue. Yasser Arafat, terrorist. It is the Arabs whom your God said, take their land. Take it away from them. And while you're taking it, kill everybody in there, but you can keep the virgins for yourself. It's in the Bible. He's a terrorist? Because his God, Allah, says, uh-uh, you go get it back. And they're not going to give it to you, so you go blow their heads off. So who's the terrorist? He's a great hero to them. He's, you know, the, it depends on which, but this is the point. You take people's land in the name of your God. You, you take their possessions. You kill their children. You kill the women. You take the virgins. And then you say, oh, this is, we did this because God said it's okay because we're his chosen people. And then the other people that say, we're going to try to get it back, they're the terrorists. But you, and you know the amazing thing? Everybody believes that's exactly the way it is. Because all they have to say is in the newspaper, the New York Times, or on television, uh, the terrorist, the Palestinian terrorist, and you bought it just like that. Remember what we said? I, I, I don't know about you, but I went to the movies when I was a little kid, 
and I rooted for John Wayne and the Cavalry. They always had blue suits with yellow scarves on their neck, you know, and round her neck she wore a yellow ribbon, and they charged, and they'd kill all the Indians. But nobody ever told me what the Indians were ticked off about. I didn't know that they were ticked off because we took their property. What if somebody comes and camps in your backyard, puts a tent up in your backyard, and tells you, hey, you get out of here? Well, we, we just accommodate our, what we believe in. So we had the, oh, and then, of course, where, where Christianity met its Waterloo was in a thing called the Crusades. They saddled up at the point of a sword, had pictures of Jesus on their flag, and they went marching into Arabia, and they got run off by the Muslims. And they're still getting run off by the Muslims. Nothing's changed. Can you imagine this? This is, this is your... This is your holy foundation. This is the foundation of your life. The Dark Ages, the Inquisitions, the Crusades, blood and guts, your religion. Violence all the way. And this is, you go to church and they support this. Go and kneel. Bloody. Huh? Do you remember? You go do this thing. Or you can't talk in church. You sing the song, I walk in the garden alone. You have these things. Maybe I'll stand there with the dew is on the roses. You'll have your suit and your tie on. And this is what it is. This is what it is. It's like Adolf Hitler. Violence, inquisitions, crusades, and all of these types of things. And that's, that's where it came from. And dark ages because people weren't allowed to think. And do you know what? If you go into their churches to this day, you know what the one thing they do not allow? They do not allow anybody to think. You go up to them and say, excuse me, your father, or excuse me, pastor, uh, can we stop the service because I wanted to mention that Jesus said that I'm better than he is. They couldn't deal with that. And yet the only person that would be in that church who was telling the truth at that time would be you, because that's exactly what he said. But the individual doesn't count in the mass psychology or the mass mind that we deal with. 2,000 years, and you've got all of these clergy, religions shooting at each other, and dogmas without proof, hypocrisy, bigotry, and all of these things. I don't think there's anything more destructive on the face of the earth than religion, and it's not just Christianity. And everyone files into the building and they entertain each other with assurances that they are right. Praise God, brother. Hallelujah, sister. You know, you're healed. The ones you're talking this, and what you're, you're right, we're right, we're all saved. And no one stops to think, is this the way it should really be? When we, we looked at this morning, you have one planet that we know of. One beautiful planet. The rest of them are all barren. This one has oceans and dolphins and beautiful trees, has beautiful birds, and they put little babies and kids and all things to have fun with, and has all, you know, snow and snowball, all kinds of beautiful things. An ozone layer to protect everybody, a regular paradise. And what did we do? Bombed it. Blew a hole in the ozone layer, Albert. Who the heck could think we'd ever do that? Blew a hole in it. They say, nobody cares. It's because why, why should you worry? This is just a bus stop, that's what they say. It's an old bus waiting stop room until you get to go to heaven where they're all going. It's just a stump on it. Heck with it. But there is so much that has been lost as far as trusting in religion is concerned because now people are sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into the animal nature. I don't know if you're watching, uh, Lynn said she was watching tonight, but Joseph Campbell, it was a pretty good interesting thing. He was talking about the chakras, and he talked about those lower three chakras, which control the animal nature. And you don't really find that point of compassion until you get to the heart chakra, which was the fourth one, compassion. And this is where the rest of them are, right here. And this is bombs and blood and rioting and fighting and competition, dog-eat-dog -dog mentality, because this is where they're at right now. It's the lower, it's the animal instinct. They've never moved up here. And this was why all the hell has been in, in so many of our lives. It was, an interesting, it was an interesting statement that he was talking about today. So the need is to seek within yourself, as Jesus Christ said, and that's the only way that you can be free of the bizarre ideas that pass for truth. And remember what Jesus said, if nothing else that you remember tonight, remember that chapter, Luke 11, verse 52, you take away the key of knowledge because you don't enter within yourself. And that's very, very important. Remember Horace Greeley? He said, go west, young man, 
Do you remember? This is a statement that he made, which I think is a lot better than that one. He said to Albert, I accept unreservedly the views of no man, living or dead. I accept unreservedly the views of no man, living or dead, which I think that's interesting. And, and I think one of the reasons that the New Age movement, if you're, uh, if you're into it, or, or is, is, is getting so much attention because people are given facts that they can investigate. And that's, that's new, say. Check it out. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of New Age stuff, you know, people who smoke and stones and all of this stuff, and they're going to rub a stone on your head and you're, everything's going to happen. Which, but forgetting that... The fact is, if we start talking from a scientific standpoint, and I tell you, hey, that Jesus and Hare Krishna had the exact same birth circumstances. The virgin birth, the wicked king, the born in the cave, the slaying of the infants, the star over the cave, exactly the same. That's it's interesting. That, hey, I'm going to check this out. That's what, that's, what, that's what I really like to see. And then people will come back and say, gee, you know, I checked this out, and I found it was true. Remember I told you that the legend <coughs> of... Uh, <laughs> the origin of God in Memphis, Egypt, was that God masturbated and the seed fell to the ground and that which was born out of the masturbation was called Atom, which of course is Adam. And of course, if you're going to use an allegorical reference, how, what are you going to do with the Adam? You put him in a garden and you call him Adam. And then what do you do? Well, if you're going to make Eve, what you would do is you would take an electron out of the atom and then the energy would multiply. So we'll take a rib out of atom. So how do we get it all started? We split the atom. But that makes too much sense. That's logical. It's scientifically accurate. So we cannot entertain. That must be a cult. It's evil. It's of the devil because it makes sense. Much better to believe that God, as it says in God's holy word, took this wretched man and ripped his rib out and made her. I can buy that. That sounds logical. That sounds good. Hallelujah and praise his holy name. Okay. So, let's, uh, as we close down on this thing, if you get to the point where, you know, you start investigating what is life and what, what are the meaning of things, where does life come from? Religion has a problem with that because they don't want you to investigate. You're not allowed to investigate. You're told this is the way it is, and if you don't believe it, you're going to be lost. And yet, we have believed it, and you find out that the world is indeed, unfortunately, lost. So when religion is silent on how miracles happen that you read about in the Bible and these phenomena and things like that, where can you turn to? You're curious, you want to understand, and let me tell you something, and listen to me very carefully right now, and I'll tell you what's going on. The reason is because of this age when people are starting to think. People are starting to investigate. And you can't turn to the church because they're not allowed to talk of these things. So you turn to the people of the East. You turn to the gurus, and you turn to the bhagwans, and you turn to the uh, oracles, and you say, what the heck is this stuff? You turn on Bill Moyers, and he shows you a man, 87 years old, who gets into a Tai Chi movement, and then they put a football player on him, and the football player can't move this guy. So how is this possible? You turn to, a, to programs like this, where they start using the acupuncture and acupressure, and say, is this really working? Well, you know, what's this all about? Where does this come from? How is this possible? To happen. And so then you turn to the sages of the East as they've been doing for many, many years. So, if you come down here, and what I want you to do, you may go up, you may not come down, you may have heard this, you say, oh, oh, well, this is radical, they're into all of that Eastern religion, gives us a bad name, so we'll change it. We'll adapt the works of Plato. Now, I mean, you, you, you can't get any more sophisticated than this, can you, Albert? Plato? Huh? Right I mean, this is taught in all the colleges and everywhere. So when you go today, say, what did that maniac talk about? Oh, Plato. <laughs> Plato. Same thing they taught in Ocean County College. In fact, they teach this in New York University. The works of Plato. You know what he was? He was a wild mystic. I mean, wow, he made Carl Jung look like a conservative, this guy. <laughs> but he certainly would be a compromise, wouldn't he, between the 
fundamentalists of the West and the mystics of the East, so we'll become Platonic. So please, when you go and they say, do you go to that weird church? And yes, yes, yes. What do they teach then now? Plato. Yes. Oh, my kid said something about Plato. Yes, Mickey, Minnie, and Plato. <laughs> so how more sophisticated can you get? We're down here tonight, and you've come down here for an evening of the studies of Plato. See, very few people understand this, that Plato in his philosophies mirrored that which is the Veda scriptures of the Hindu Krishna. The Veda were the Hindu scriptures of Krishna. Plato mirrored them in his philosophies. And these scriptures had come thousands of years before Plato was born. He taught them. And what I'm saying to you is this great voice out of uh, Greece who, who, who we study in all of the colleges and universities all over the world taught Hinduism right to the core. But Plato originated much more. Plato received much of the same sort of wisdom that is not in the Vedas that he taught, which is very interesting. This is what Plato taught, and uh, it'll take us a minute and then we'll go. Plato taught that justice was in the soul. And this is what Plato said to you, and to you, and to you, and to you who are on television, and all of the things like what Jesus said. Plato said, if man can transcend himself, he can find justice. He couldn't accept any philosophy that did not contain spiritual aspirations. That's what Plato was. For Plato, philosophy and spirit were one and the same. And this is what he strove for. He strove, Plato called it, real knowledge. Real knowledge. Knowledge of that which really exists as, as opposed to that which requires faith. I mean, this is, this is what, this is what, this is what I'm trying to speak to you here about. I'm trying to speak here to you about having a knowledge that really, really exists. Something that's provable. Not something that you have to have faith. Now, Jesus Christ told you to practice the single eye. Jesus Christ told you to enter within yourself. Jesus Christ says, cast your net to the right side. Jesus Christ says, take no thought. And look at on page 873 what Jesus Christ said would happen if you would do what he said to do. In John chapter 8, that's all right, Tommy, he's just going there. John chapter 8 and verse 32. And Jesus Christ said in verse 31, if you continue in my word, in other words, that's pay attention to what I tell you, you're my disciples and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Being free. And who are you going to be free of? You're going to be free of the religionists. You're going to be free of the systems of oppression which have oppressed the world because you're going to be an individual. You're going to know. You're not going to have to depend on me. You're not going to depend on anybody else. to tell. You're going to know. You're going to know truth within yourself. And this is Plato wrote of the first principle of all principles, the, the, the supreme idea in which all other ideas are, are made. And he said, the monarch, the lawgiver of the universe, the ultimate, ultimate substance from which all other beings derive their being. And this is what Plato said. Though this eternal essence of things might not be perceptible by our physical senses, it may be apprehended by the mind of those who are not too slow that it is all within themselves. But know what he said. Listen to what he said. It may be apprehended by the minds of those who are not too slow. And you and me have been very slow because we've been warned to stay away from that which Plato said you must do. Jesus Christ said you must enter within yourself. Plato said you must enter within yourself. And who do we take? Jesus and Plato? No, Jimmy Swaggart and Oral Roberts says this is evil, and that's who we follow. The hell with Plato, the hell with Jesus, I'm following Oral and Jimmy. 
You know why? Because Jesus didn't want to control your life and Plato didn't want to control your life. Both of these people wanted you to be free and both of you wanted, the, wanted you to find out the origin of the universe and what flows in the universe and so they wanted you to know this. The Swaggerts and those other people wanted to control your life and so they said to stay away from this thing. Now, this is the last thing I say tonight. And it's in, on page 950. Because the Apostle Paul said the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And he would say this to those people who said that you've got to ask Jesus to come into your heart and all of this kind of thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Don't you know that your own selves know that how Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates? You know what reprobates mean? You're too slow. You're too slow. That's exactly what Plato said. And I'm sure Paul studied Plato. But Plato and Paul didn't say you had to invite Christ into anything. He said, don't you know how that Christ is in you? Except you be reprobates. Except you're too slow. And there's no reason for you to be too slow. And you're going to continue to be slower and slower and slower if you allow the systems to teach you their ways. You've got to find your way. It's like Frank Sinatra saying, <laughs> do it my way. You've got to do it your way your own self, within yourself, not to be an allegiance to anybody. Thank you very much for sharing this time, a little bit of Plato and the rest of 